Hello, my name is Brandi Pethel and I'm the Master Gardener Extension Volunteer for Jackson County University of Georgia Extension. This presentation is on plant pruning, why, when, and how. So the first thing is to ask a couple questions. You want to ask, um, why are you pruning? Um, you want to ask what happens when you prune? You want to find out when to prune? And then how, how to prune, how are you pruning? So when we answer all these questions, then we're ready to prune. So the first question is why prune? Um, there are good reasons to prune. Uh, many fruit production trees require pruning in order to have proper shape and proper light uh, reaching the inside of, of the tree or shrub. Uh, and that's a good reason to prune. Uh, Deadwood is always a good reason to prune, uh, cutting out uh, dead, also diseased uh, branches out of trees and shrubs. Um, cross branches, there can be places where branches are crossing and rubbing each other. Um, these are all, all those kind of places are where you can have a wound to the bark, which is the protection uh, of the tree or shrub, and you can cause places for disease or insects to have easy access in. Um, there's a gardening style with tree called espalier. Um, you've seen maybe apple trees that are up against a wall. Um, I have some pictures at the end of the presentation because I'm not going to cover that in this presentation. That's an um, advanced uh, type of pruning. Um, but it's, it's more of a decorative style of pruning. pruning. And then there's a formal garden style. So um, really straight row hedges and uh, things you kind of see in like French uh, gardens. Um, if you think about the big castles and the formal gardens that they had outside. So those are, those are good reasons to prune. Um, there are some questionable reasons to prune, things that you really want to kind of take a step back and think about. So is the shrub or tree too big and it's blocking the view? Is it blocking a view of your window or say of a roadway? Uh, is it too tall? Is it getting into power lines? The question I want you to ask rather than it's too big and I need to prune it is, is this in the right, is this the right plant in the right place? Um, Something I did when I purchased my home is I pulled out all of the giant holly shrubs that were planted and they were all on top of each other. You couldn't even see. We had a, a line of decorative brickwork around the front of the house and we couldn't even see it. Didn't even know it was there until we pulled out the, the shrubs. They were coming up halfway up, up the windows um, in front of the house. You couldn't see out. Uh, and what we did is pulled those up um, and replanted shrubs that would grow to the proper window height. So you may have to get out there and measure and find out um, how tall of a plant can fit in a space. Um, same thing with roadways or getting into power lines. We recently uh, in our neighborhood had some crepe myrtles that were getting up into the power lines and we asked this question, is this the right plant in the right place? Kind of ties into bullet point number two as well. Um, is it a good reason to prune because everyone else is doing it? And the, the famous example of this is crepe myrtles. Um, these trees are beautiful. They have beautiful natural form. Um, what, what happens the way most people cut them back is called topping. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but it's, it does quite a bit of damage to the tree and the health of the tree. Um, crepe myrtles have beautiful form. Um, when they're planted in the right place. Um, last question is, well, don't all plants need to be pruned? And really, they don't. Uh, there's some fruit trees that we need pruning, kind of like we mentioned earlier, but most plants, they really don't require pruning. Sometimes we require pruning because it's not the right plant for the right place. All right, so here's some examples, um, some pictures of right plant, right place. So you can see these two really large holly shrubs. Um, these are probably uh, Nellie Stevens holly shrubs. Really popular in um, uh, foundation plantings uh, for houses. But these shrubs want to be 15, 20 feet tall. You can see here in this picture, I. You can't even see the front of the house. They probably haven't seen out these windows in years. Um, 
these need to be either cut down at ground level um, and uh, treat, treat the stumps so that they won't sprout back and plant something else there or hire someone to come dig out the stumps. Um, you really want to consider, like I have here, remove it, re transplant it, replace it. Um, if that's not an option, you really are going to have to prune these. And they're probably 10 years past when they should have been started, you know, started pruning. These are going to be really tough to get pruned back to a manageable level. And you got to remember, these, these shrubs want to be 20 feet tall. So no matter how you cut and prune, it's going to constantly be trying to return to that natural shape um, that's kind of wired into the DNA of the plant of how tall and how big it needs to be. Um, plants that I see that are constantly the wrong plant in the, in the place is hollies, like in this picture, crepe myrtles. Um, Japanese maples too. A lot of times people plant those way too close to the house. They get mature and you have half of the branches, you know, up into a porch or crossing over a, um, a sidewalk. Uh, so this is a really important question to ask in any kind of gardening and planting. Is it the right plant in the right place? Um, and particularly with pruning. As you can probably guess, I don't like pruning. <laughs> it's a lot of work and back-breaking work and I'd much rather be um, doing other things in the garden than spending my time pruning. So right plant, right place may solve a lot of problems for you if you are like me and you don't really care for, for constant pruning. <laughs> Here's that picture of everyone is doing it. Just because everyone is pruning their crepe myrtles, this is called crepe murder. Um, it doesn't mean you have to do it. This, they have a really beautiful natural form. So this is an example of bad pruning. You can see these really harsh cuts that had to be done with a saw. Um, you can properly prune a crepe myrtle, but it's pruning back anything that's smaller than about the size of your pinky finger. These are clearly larger than pinky finger. Um, this has topped the tree. It now has a root system that is way too big for what's left of the canopy, which is nothing. Um, and it just, they're not very pretty this time of year. Um, they, they've done some research and some people say that they've cut, they cut them because the, uh, they want to see more flowers. Well, the, the, the plant is going to produce once it's mature the same number of flowers regardless of whether you prune it or not. Um, the next picture I have, this is one of my crepe myrtles. I, um, I murdered it a couple times because the people that we bought the house from, it was murdered. And so I thought, well, that's just what you're supposed to do. And then I learned that crepe myrtles really do have beautiful form. And you can correct some of the um, the bad pruning that has happened over the years. Like I said, I'm guilty of it myself. You can see some of the stubs that I just haven't haven't gotten in there to be able to cut them out to um, reduce some of that place for disease to come in. Um, but if you stop the bad pruning and let it grow, you can go back in and you can kind of selective prune, uh, which we'll get into later where you're actually trying to thin the crown. Honestly, this one probably needs um, some of that selective pruning done because the, the crown is pretty thick in the summer and it could use a couple places to remove some cross branches and things like that. But I just want to show you, this is my crepe myrtle. This was taken in February um, and it's, it's a beautiful tree. Even with the dried, um, <laughs> the dried seed heads there, the dried fruits on the tree, it still is a very interesting tree. Um, and it doesn't require topping in order to have that, that interest. Again, we talked about this. Plants evolved without gardeners, so they don't need to be pruned. There's, you know, plants have DNA that makes them a certain shape, size, length, height. You know, th they're going to try to, to bring that to fruition. Uh, if you're constantly pruning, you're, you're kind of fighting against what the plant actually is trying to do. And so you're, unless you're pruning very specifically, as in espalier or fruit tree, um, you're, you're going to be fighting against the plant more than um, working with the plant. Um, and it's hard work, too. Um, it can be dangerous when involving ladders and powered equipment. And there's nothing that I 
really despise more in garden work than picking up leaves and branches from pruning because it just makes a big mess. So they don't have to be pruned. Uh, here's some photos. These are both Nellie R. Stevens holly. So these are probably the same species that were in those really big, um, the really big hollies planted in front of uh, the house. Uh, these in the picture uh, in the foreground is probably close to that mature height. Um, these in, that are kind of in the background, these are pruned into a hedge and they probably have to cut that. They may have to cut it monthly during the grow growing season, um, if, if not, you know, more frequently in the growing season and then they can kind of let it, um, let it sit in the off season. But if I had to, if I could ask somebody at Texas Tech, I would and, and ask them just how frequently they're having to prune those um, to keep them in that shape. It's a whole lot of work. It's beautiful, but it's a whole lot of work. Okay, so we talked about why are we pruning. Um, we'll get into some tools and, and what we use to prune. Uh, using the right tool when you do decide, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prune this plant, having the right tools to do it uh, makes a big difference. Um, so these are the general tools we're going to kind of go through. Some of them you've probably seen before, some of them may be new. Uh, these are hand pruners, so you're going to be cutting things less than a half inch in diameter. Um, so that's, again, if you remember geometry, that's across. So if you, if you cut a branch, you're measuring from one side of the circle to the other, and that's a half inch. So we're not talking wrapping it around. We're not talking the... Um, that's wrong. Okay, so here's the pruning tools. Uh, they're hand pruners. So these are things that are less than a half inch in diameter. So <laughs> okay, so these are hand pruners. We're going to be using hand pruners to cut any branches that are less than half inch in diameter. So that's from one side of the branch if you're looking at a cross section right across the circular branch to the other side. Um, so that's from one piece of bark over to the other piece of bark on the other side. So these are pretty small, um, pretty small branches we're cutting here. So uh, down at the bottom the yellow is an anvil and blade pruner. These have one sharp blade that uh, cuts against a broad flat grooved blade. Um, these are typically easier to make some of those bigger cuts um, they're, they're not as, uh, smooth of a cut though as the scissor or bypass pruners. Uh, they've got a sharpened blade that cuts across another bl sharp blade, but it is, um, it's also a thick blade that it cuts across. Uh, these typically cost a little more than the anvil type pruners, uh, but they do make close smooth cuts. So with an anvil pruner, you're not going to be able to get quite as close of a cut right where you, you know, where you want it in tight spaces. So these uh, are not hand pruners, they are uh, loppers, apologize for the typo there. Um, these are used to cut anywhere from half inch to one inch diameter branches. Um, so lopping shears, these open up kind of like scissors, but uh, those long handles really give you a lot of um, strength to be able to make those large cuts. So. Um, if you have, if you lack hand strength and the hand pruners are really hard to use, you can use lopping shears to do a good bit of, of the pruning. They are going to be a little harder to get into some cramped places, um, but they do a good job. All right, these are pruning saws. So these are going to be things greater than one and a half inch in diameter. Uh, there's the bow saw that has this um, kind of handle along it to support the blade. And then there's a curved blade hand saw at the bottom. Um, they also make these curved blade hand saws folding so that you can kind of cover the teeth up and you can, you know, stick it in your, um, your wheelbarrow that you're bringing around to do your pruning um, and not, you know, risk bending the, the teeth or grabbing onto them. Um, these have really narrow blades, so they're a little easier to, to move. And uh, the one at the bottom with a curved blade, it has um, the blade such that when you pull back is whenever it cuts. So when you push forward, it's gliding through uh, the plant material, and when you pull back is whenever it's making its cut. Um, and the, the bow saw, the one with the, the kind of uh, structure to it at the top there, 
Um, these are difficult to use in tight areas, as you can obviously tell. You know, if you have some tight branches you're trying to cut, that, that uh, support structure is going to be hard to get into tight spaces. This is a pole pruner. Just like it says, it's a pruner on the end of a pole. Um, you can use it to cut branches from trees that can't be reached from the ground. Uh, you operate that blade by pulling that rope. Um, you just want to be careful. You don't want to use this near an electrical line, of course, because of the risk of electrocution. Then you have your power tools. So you get chainsaw, powered hedge trimmer. Um, both of these can be dangerous. Uh, of course, the chainsaw is the most dangerous tool because that blade is, is pretty close to where your hands are operating. Um, the hedge trimmer um, is really quick at trimming the edges of branches, but as we'll get in a little bit later, it's not really great at stimulating the growth that you want to stimulate in a plant. It's really quick and dirty to get the shape that you need. Um, it creates a dense outer canopy with little to no growth on the inside. Uh, and they're mostly used for the more formal garden shrubs uh, where you're going to be kind of like in that picture with Texas Tech University and then Nellie R. Stevens Hollies. You're really trying to get a specific shape and there's going to be a lot of work involved in keeping that hedge trimmed at the proper, um, proper size. Okay. So we talked about why to prune, we talked about the tools you can use to prune. So what exactly happens in a plant when you prune? What happens when you cut that branch? So reducing the crown, so that's the top part of the plant, the part where the leaves are, where photosynthesis is happening, it reduces that ratio of crown to root. So the plant's bringing in nutrients from the soil, bringing in water from the soil to support the crown that's above the soil. After you prune, you now have an extensive root system for a lot less canopy. So what that tells the plant is, hey, we just lost some of the crown. We need to grow more. So pruning stimulates growth, okay? By removing the tip of a branch, by pruning, you're starting an invigorating process within that branch. When you remove that growing tip, you destroy what's called apical dominance which means this, this is what grows from the end and it stimulates growth from the lateral buds. So when you cut the tip off, what happens is you can see here in A, they cut the tip of this branch off. What happens later is B, where you have all these little side shoots that get really long. Okay, so it stimulates growth from those lateral buds. The lateral buds are those up and down the sides of the branch. This is a hormonal process. Auxin is produced in the growing tip, and while it's being produced, it's sending messages to these lateral buds that says, I'm growing, I'm good, you don't need to grow, everything's great, I'm growing, and then when you cut it, all of a sudden that message is no longer there, and these lateral buds say, hey, something's happened at the end of the plant, we need to grow, okay? Super, super simplified, obviously, but it just gives you the, the, the picture that you need to know what happens whenever you clip the end of a branch off. Additionally, pruning can stimulate lateral growth due to sunlight that's maybe available to a part of the plant where it wasn't there before. So sunlight can, can trigger growth in those lateral buds as well. Auxin is also, just as interesting little side note here, auxin is also the hormone that uh, is responsible for phototropism. You know, in, in grade school where you had a a bean plant and you moved a light, you know, had a light only on one side and the bean plant grew up and leaned towards the light or um, if you've grown tomato seedlings in your windowsill, you've probably seen them stretching towards the windowsill. So auxin moves to the dark side of the plant and causes those plant cells to kind of swell, which makes the plant lean in one direction. A little cool tidbit. Okay, so now we know, okay, pruning is not always necessary, but when it is necessary, we use tools to do that. Um, I didn't mention, but don't don't break branches off. You cause you can cause a lot of damage whenever you snap a branch. I'm pretty sure I referenced that later, but in case I don't, I wanted to make sure I told you. That's why we have those tools there. And then we talked about okay, well, what happens when we prune? So you're causing hormonal changes in the plant. Okay, when? When do you prune? Does it matter when you prune? 
It does in certain plants. So spring flowering shrubs, those are things that are getting ready to flower now. Anything that blooms before May should be pruned right after they bloom. These shrubs set their flower buds in the fall on old growth. So here's an azalea in the picture. If you cut your azalea back in February, you just cut all the buds off and it won't bloom again until the next spring. Um, same with uh, some of the hydrangeas. If you cut them back in January because you forgot to cut them back in the summertime right after they bloomed, um, or late spring after they bloomed, uh, if you cut them back in the winter because you're trying to tidy up the garden, you've cut all the buds off and it won't bloom. Um, I think every gardener has run into this issue at some point or another where they said, oh, yeah, that was one of those I was supposed to prune after it bloomed. And, and you, you make the mistake once and you you remember usually from, from then on out. There's some exceptions, of course. The oak leaf hydrangea and the late flowering azaleas, they bloom in the summer, but they actually do form their flower buds in the fall. So you don't want to cut back an oak leaf hydrangea. Um, until after it blooms. Cut it back right after it blooms if you need to. And same with the late flowering azaleas. But those are going to happen in the summertime. If you cut those buds or if you cut those shrubs back in the winter, um, like when we'll get to it next with the rest of the summer flowering, you've cut the buds off. So they're again not going to flower. Your summer flowering shrubs, they tend to set their flower buds on new growth. And then, and so that means that plants that flower after May can be pruned in the winter. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you just want to be careful pruning them too late in the winter, early spring, because you may be, um, especially after it starts putting on new growth, if you start trimming it, it, it you, you're going to be cutting off some of those uh, new buds. All right, so that's flowering. But what about ornamentals that we don't grow for flowers? So here in this picture, we've got some red bud trees. Um, you can prune them late winter, spring or summer. Uh, you want to avoid pruning in early winter because, or in, in fall, because remember we said before, when you, when you prune, all of a sudden that oxen messenger stops and the plant says, oh, we need to grow. Uh, Pruning in early winter, whenever it's still a little warm sometimes, maybe we haven't had a, had a first frost, can trigger a growth spurt of, you know, new growth from pruning. And then you get that frost and you get frostbite, you get frost damage um, on all that new growth of the shrub. <clears throat> also, some trees are heavy sap bleeders, maples, birches, dogwoods, beech, elm, willow, flowering plum, flowering cherry. You want to wait until their leaves mature before pruning to reduce unsightly sap. So um, there's also some shrubs that, that kind of bleed uh, sap to the lower petalum is one. Um, you just want to make sure that you're not in, you're in a kind of a mature place in the season rather than a, a really growing place because you don't want the sap to be pushed out of the tree. The sap is what's... Um, it's kind of the lifeblood of the tree. It's pushing nutrients out to the leaves in order for the leaves to continue to grow. And if it's kind of bleeding that out, it attracts insects. It can attract um, diseases and things like that too.
All right, so we've been a lot of places so far. We've talked about why to prune, <clears throat> tools to use to prune. Um, we've talked about when to prune. We've talked about what happens when you prune. So now, all right, let's get to the meat of this, right? How do you prune? How do you decide what to cut and what to leave? So first, in any pruning, um, any plant that you are wanting to prune, you want to first remove dead wood. Prune back that dead wood back to the live wood, like you can see here in this picture. This is actually a diseased branch, but it is dying. Because <laughs> um, you want to prevent further dieback. If you leave a little stub there, um, the plan is going to work to try and uh, continue to cut that off and stop uh, nutrients from going that way. Uh, if you're moving diseased wood, don't forget to sanitize your pruners. You can um, Google and find out several different ways to go about uh, <coughs> sanitizing your pruners. I always think it's a really good idea to gently remove last season's leaves. So especially, you know, I have a um, Japanese magnolia that I, I pull those, gently rake those leaves off and it just makes it easier for you to be able to see the structure of the tree. Um, and here we go. Use pruners. Don't just break off branches. Um, this branch here, if you were to break it, you may sliver the bark down. And that's just a whole nother place. You've damaged healthy bark. Uh, it's another place for insects and disease to get in. So you've got your dead branches cut back. You've got your leaves pulled off. Pulled off. Step back from the, tr sh the shrub and look at the form of it. Are there crossing branches? Are there rubbing branches? Are there branches kind of sticking up in an awkward direction that don't look natural to the rest of the tree? Are there any weak branches that you need to remove? And those uh, typically are branches that grow in like a V union versus a U. Um, branches with a really sharp angle in the middle. And uh, if you have a large shrub or tree, you might want to mark those branches that you want to keep or mark the ones you want to remove with some string or some, you know, marking tape or something like that. Just to kind of help give you an idea of what you're going to be left with. So here's a blown up picture of that that was on the screen. So you can see what's in dark here is the, um, the parts of this shrub, this tree that are going to remain. And all the ones that are light are the ones that they're planning to remove. So these are branches or full uh, stems coming from the bottom to cut back. Everywhere they've got the little colored lines are different um, cuts that they're making. So down at the bottom, these are extra trunks and suckers in the red that they're cutting back. They're cutting them all the way back, down all the way down to where it starts growing. In blue, they've got redundant and interior crossing branches. So these are just places where there's maybe an extra branch that just doesn't make sense to the form of the tree. So they're cutting those back. Notice in the picture, they're not just cutting the ends off. They cut it all the way back to um, <clears throat> the main trunk. The green ones in the middle here, these are just low branches. They're um, something you do to kind of raise the canopy of the tree. And then the, the black ones are just pencil thin growth. Again, that kind of goes back to that pinky um, analogy that I use, cutting back things that are smaller than your pinky. Um, it's not necessary to do, but you can. If, you, if you're trying to thin back uh, the canopy so that you get more light in, more air in, that is, uh, that is a way that you can go and do that. Typically, a woody ornamental can withstand pruning up to a third of the crown. Now, this one back here, this is more than a third. I, I would not advise maybe all these cuts in the same year. If you cut one of these <clears throat> main branch leaders off and then maybe made some more of these cuts, maybe the next year cut this other branch, I think it would be a, uh, a healthier way to trim, uh, prune that tree. If you prune too much, the plant's going to struggle to regrow because it doesn't have all that leaf surface that it once, surface area it once had for photosynthesis. And also put in here, don't forget about that bloom, bloom time. Spring, you're going to prune after you bloom. Summer and fall, you want to prune in the winter. So you do want to avoid shearing. So that's using those uh, hedge trimmers that I was mentioning before. You end up with a dense outer canopy and few leaves, little foliation inside. You have reduced airflow 
And anytime you reduce the airflow in a plant, you're increasing your chances for diseases. If you do have to shear, it's always good practice to keep the base wider than the top. You have maximum sunlight that can get in. You can see on this picture on the left, uh, the sun shines down and it hits the leaves on top, which shadows the bottom. So those bottom parts of that shrub are going to constantly struggle to be as thick as the top because they just don't get the same sunlight. But over here on the, the left, um, the bottom part of the plant is getting the same amount of sunlight as these upper sides of the plant. Okay, so there's a couple different types of pruning cuts. Um, not all of them are good ways to prune unless the effect is what is what you want in your plant, if that makes sense. So um, heading. Over here, you can see these little dashed lines. These are where the cuts are made. And then this is what will result from a heading cut. So the heading cut removes that terminal portion of the stem or branch, that place where the apical dominance is, where the auxin is putting out its message saying, no need to grow, no need to grow, I'm still here. Well, once that message is cut off, you can see these lateral buds have started to grow. What you get is this really thick, compact growth, but you also lose the natural form of the shrub. So once you start heading a plant, most of the time with repeated heading, you are going to have to continue heading the plant because uh, not many times can they return to their natural, their natural form. It's also called topping, dehorning. This is also what happens when we hedge cut our, um, our shrubs. When you're only cutting the very tips of the branches off, you're getting these kind of bushy uh, ends of, of the branches and it's causing a, a, causing sun, a difficulty for the plant to get sunlight into the inside of the shrub and clipping if you're gonna clip the hedges. I know this is an extreme picture of topping, but it really does a good job of showing you how that that really bushy kind of, I don't know, it's just crazy looking growth to me. It looks completely unnatural. Uh, and I, I don't know why these trees were cut this way. It could be that there was a house nearby and they, the tree was dropping branches and rather than cut the tree down entirely, they decided to top it. I, I don't know. I don't see power lines. Again, I don't understand why this was done, but this was the result. Um, you're left with some pretty ugly trees. So the next type of cut is called thinning. Uh, this is what we saw back in the picture that talked about all the different kind of general cuts when you were looking at the natural form of a shrub or tree. It removes the entire shooter limb to its point of origin on the main branch. So here we have the example here where we say we make a cut here and a cut here. What that will do is take this branch and this branch and tell them, hey, you need to grow some, you know, activate your lateral buds because we've lost some canopy here, here and here, but it wasn't to these branches and so it didn't cause them to get all bushy and crazy. Uh, those, that new growth occurs on the undisturbed limbs so it, it's the least invigorating of all these kind of cuts. It maintains the natural form of the tree or shrub. And that apical dominance is maintained. We didn't touch this tip here and this tip here. So you didn't end up with, uh, like I said, with that, that crazy growth. You can use this to shorten limbs, improve light penetration into a plant, and kind of direct the growth. So if, if you want the plant to grow this way, and not this way, you could cut this branch off and it would stimulate growth in this direction. This one is used, uh, it's, it's one of the more frequent uh, pruning techniques used. You can use this to keep uh, shrubs from growing up next to your house. You know, you can cut back the branches all the way back to the main trunk that are pointed in the wrong direction and pointed in the direction you don't want them to grow. So here's a, a little visual of before thinning and after thinning. It's just like, just like it sounds. You're thinning the growth. You're not just cutting the top off. 
Um, you are taking branches all the way back to where they start uh, on, the, on the tree or shrub. And uh, you're keeping that kind of natural form that you have in the plant. So when you're pruning large, larger branches, you want to really be careful about causing further damage to the tree. You use a, me a method called drop crotching. And what this does is it's a series of three cuts that prevents bark from the weight of the branch kind of falling and tearing the bark off the tree. So in a vertical, if we're cutting off this top piece of branch here and we're gonna leave this piece, you're gonna make a notch here and then you're going to make this, this cut, which is the second cut, because the first cut is the notch. The reason this notch is here is if when you make this cut, this piece of heavy branch falls to one way or the other, this notch is gonna give it a weak point and it's not gonna tear the bark. All right, then once you get the weight off of the tree here, or the shrub, then you cut this third cut. All right, kind of flip it in picture B. If we were gonna cut this side branch off and we wanna keep this large uh, trunk here, you're gonna make a notch here. You're then gonna cut from this direction towards the knot, again over here, you would cut in this direction. You're gonna cut this way so that when you get here and this branch starts getting heavy and starts falling, you're not gonna tear your bark down here and possibly get into this collar area. So you make this cut, oops, you make this cut and you get the heavy part of the branch off. Then you have a stub left, don't leave the stub. Come back and make that third cut um, without disturbing this collar tissue here. Tearing the bark like that, the bark is where the life of the plant of the tree is, the tree or shrub. That's where the xylem and phloem is that carries nutrients up and waste uh, water up and food down into the roots. It's the movement, it's the blood vessels of the tree. So damaging the, the trunk uh, damages that process in the plant. Um, All right, this type of cut is called bench cutting. Um, this type of cutting you really want to avoid um, trimming a, a really good and strong upright branch uh, in favor of a horizontal branch is going to leave you with vigorous shoot growth. Um, they're often called water sprouts. And they'll occur on a horizontal branch or um, kind of like in that picture of the trees where we showed topping. Um, it'll occur wherever the plant has some active lateral buds. Uh, so you can see here, this is an example of the wrong way. If you were uh, trying to shorten the height of this, this shrub, this tree, if you cut here, all you're left is with this little kind of arm stuck out to the side. And you see you're going to end up with just some real strange, unnatural looking growth. If you're trying to reduce the height of a plant, you're going to try to do it while maintaining some of that natural form. This one still looks a little funny to me. Um, it's still got a lot of these, uh, these growths, but they're not all parallel to each other. They're, it's not as unnatural looking um, as, as a bench cut is. So if you think about it, a bench cut would be like cutting something so that you could, you know, set a bench, sit on it like a bench. All right, so I mentioned this uh, collar tissue area. Um, there's some, so not only does pruning um, affect the hormonal passage of information uh, messages within a plant, but the plant also has to heal from it. So healing occurs right there at the side of the pruning cut. 
And what happens is the plant kind of walls off areas in order to protect it from disease. Because once once that that bark and that cambium, that living wood is open um, to the air and the environment, it's a uh, it's kind of like a calling, calling for insects and diseases to come um, and get into the tree. So the, the tree is going to work as quickly as it can, which is slow in terms of tree, or <laughs> slow in terms of moving animals like us, but very quickly in terms of a tree to uh, wall that off and protect itself from um, further disease. So for fastest healing, you need to cut close to the main branch without damaging the collar tissue or the bark ridge. So if you look at a shrub, you're gonna see almost a little, um, I'm trying to think of, like, it's a little ridge where, where the trunk and the bark, or the branch, the bark in between kind of got bunched up, you know? So you wanna, you don't wanna hit any of that bark ridge and you want to stay away from this collar tissue, which is the joining place of the branch into the tree trunk. So you want to get close to that, but not into it. And you don't want to leave a stub. So if you cut, you know, just right here, and this is what you left, what the plant has to do is wa still wall off here where it would before, but it has to do it gradually. And gradually work its way down to get it walled off to the proper location. So the, the tree is going to be spending energy and resources trying to wall that off and not spending those resources on leaves and flowers which is probably the reason why you're growing the tree it's also another place to invite uh, disease and insects to invade <coughs> so this is some more uh, photos some more uh, images of a proper cut that stays out of this Branch collar stays away from the bark ridge. If you cut into the bark ridge, um, it's injured. And now the, the plant is probably going to um, have some loss on this side because it, it's injured into the piece of bark where the xylem and phloem is going. You may have uh, canopy die off up here at the top. Um, due to this side of the tree unable to get uh, nutrients anymore, water and nutrients. And leaving a stub is bad. It's vulnerable to insects and diseases. And like I said, the plant is going to little by little work to wall this off so that diseases and uh, pests can't get in there up until the point where we should have made the cut to begin with over on this one. So this is a picture of a, 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 uh, a wound from pruning. Um, it's not a bad thing. It, you, you make a wound whenever, it, whenever you make a pruning cut. Um, a good pruning cut heals well and heals kind of in this circular fashion. Um, people ask a lot about wound dressings and do I need to paint something? Does it need a band-aid? That kind of thing. They really don't do a whole lot to help the healing process. They can actually do more harm than good if there's fungi or bacteria in the area. Um, it just makes more work for the plant to then have to fight that off as it's trying to heal from the pruning wound. Plants properly pruned, that's hard to say that one three times. Plants properly pruned or plants pruned properly, they will heal the wound just fine. It's part of their natural process to do that. Um, it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, but over time, you will see that where you made proper pruning cuts, the um, tree or shrub healed just fine from it. Okay. A lot of information. We talked last about how do you prune? What are the proper cuts to make to get the growth that you want in a shrub? We talked about the tools. We talked about why to prune, mostly based on right plant, right place. We talked about um, what happens in a plant when you prune it. And um, we also didn't talk about a lot of pruning to topics. So bonsai, that's one I actually left out in the beginning. Bonsai is a reason to prune. Uh, bonsai pruning is not only canopy, but it's root pruning. So bonsai 
our normal form of trees and shrubs that have been root pruned to stay small. So remember I talked before that when we prune the canopy of a plant, it's got these big roots that now have less canopy to support. So that same model, that same idea applies to bonsai. So if you keep the roots small, then the canopy doesn't need to grow large. If you do that over time, it, the plant is trained in there into that space. But if you stop root pruning, the plant will grow to be its normal size. Now in this case, in a little tiny pot, um, the plant is probably going to suffer from uh, disease and lack of nutrients before um, it becomes a giant tree in that little tiny pot. Uh, below that, obviously we didn't cover topiary. Um, all that says to me is a whole lot of work. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any topiary at my house. Uh, I know that this is a formal garden somewhere and they probably have people hired that that's their job is to maintain the topiary there. Um, that is a whole art form, um, not something that I can cover in a um, quick pruning video. Uh, fruit production, there's, uh, there's so much documentation out. You can go to Extension, uh, UGA Extension website. If you have apple trees, pear trees, uh, plum, cherry, and you want to learn about pruning those trees in particular, there's plenty of uh, documents for specific fruits that tell you how to prune those trees. Um, but that's a whole another uh, a whole another class all in of itself. And then below it is that espalier that I was explaining. Um, it's a way of training. It's usually done with fruit trees. It's a way of having a fruit tree in a garden that maybe you don't really have the space for the full canopy of a, of a fruit tree. And so it's trained in, in, in an unnatural shape. You can see the parallel lines um, grown in a V-shape here on that main leader for this apple tree. Um, beautiful, beautiful way of growing trees. Beautiful way of having apples in a very small and compact space. Um, again, pruning topics not covered in this class. Uh, so, I wanted to touch in on the resources that I used and referenced in making this presentation. You can go to the UJ Extension website and type in Bulletin 949, or you can type Basic Principles of Pruning Woody Plants, and you can get a document that you can print, or you can just reference there on the web uh, for more information, a deeper dive into pruning woody, woody plants. And then... Bulletin 961 is about pruning your ornamental plants in the landscape. Um, so this, this one gets into a little bit more of the flowering versus the spring flowering versus summer flowering um, trees and shrubs and things like that. And also tools. And that is the end of the show. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Um, if you guys have questions, you can always reach me. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, whether it's about pruning or anything else, home and garden, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, it's jcmgev at uga.edu. That's Jackson County Master Gardener Extension Volunteer, jcmgev at uga.edu. Again, my name's Brandy Pethel. I'm Master Gardener Extension Volunteer here in Jackson County. And uh, I hope you guys learned something about pruning. Um, and 
can, you know, share this video with friends or anyone that you think may need to learn a, a thing or two about pruning. Have a great day.